I just want to show y'all real quick an average evening, kind of after school, and what's going on here at the farm. Doing homework. Hey, I'm, not, I'm not doing homework anymore. I just finished. Oh, good job. All right, here's a voiceover to spare you that awful background noise. I'm telling you how I skimmed all of the cream off these jars of milk, giving me this full gallon, as well as the almost full gallon, is about three quarters, that is in the mixer. So I've shown before making butter in a mixer, but if you've never seen that before, um, if you take heavy cream, which is, isn't exactly economical to do if you're buying heavy cream from the store, because like a little, you know, a quart of heavy cream is more than a pound of butter. But if you have a cow, you end up with a lot of cream. So I just did, um, I just did a, a jar that was probably close to half a gallon and I got this much butter out of it. And of course, this buttermilk, it's not cultured, so it's not the same as the cultured buttermilk that you get from the store. But, so cultured buttermilk comes from culturing the milk before you make butter and then you get cultured butter and cultured buttermilk, buttermilk, but you can also kind of culture this after the fact. But as it is right now, this is kind of more like a whey product. It's still good for baking with, but I usually like today, this is gonna go to the pigs because obviously we have a lot of milk. So the next step here is I got these little butter petals. These were actually sent to me by a viewer from our Amazon, Amazon wish list. And I try to say, like do the little thank you notes on there when they come with those. But a lot of times if it's from a third party seller, it doesn't come with um, a note. So I don't know who sent these to me, but whoever you are, thank you. Uh, this has made butter making so much easier. Um, bring you guys down where you can see. So I did previously do this with my hands um, and it was just not super fun. I'm kind of a, a texture person and um, I would have a really hard time getting the butter off my hands. They'd be super soft though. But this allows me to squeeze the buttermilk off. So I usually just do this a handful of times, kind of start getting the buttermilk out of the butter. Um, you don't want to leave any in there because it will spoil before the butter does and your butter will start tasting really cheesy. So what I do after you can kind of see there's like the buttermilk is kind of starting to pull up here. So I get a little bucket of ice water and I go ahead and put this in there. That's going to help it solidify, make it a little more workable because it was starting to get really soft and also just wash the uh, excess off the outside. And I'll let this sit in here for just like four or five minutes. So it's nice and cool, kind of solidifies a little bit more. Um, and then I'll do that again with the paddles a handful of times until I don't see anything, you know, like squeezing out. And what I've been doing is I've actually been using these paddles. Um, these are made by Kilner is the brand if you're looking for something like this. Obviously you could make something like this. Um, this is neat because these have kind of like a texture on one side. So what I've been doing is using these and breaking the butter into small sections and kind of forming it into sticks, which I wrap in parchment paper and put in this bag in the freezer. And so I end up with like this. I'm not weighing these. Yeah, this one's like way heavier than that one. This is like a store stick of butter. That other one's kind of small, not weighing them. I don't really use much measurement when I cook, so it doesn't really matter that much. I'm just eyeballing it. And what I've been doing for like just using it, like we have banana bread to have butter out, um, is like the night before, I'll pull one out of the freezer and stick it in like this little butter dish on the counter. Um, this isn't gonna last a really long time on the counter, it's, but usually with all of the sourdough bread and the different things that I make, and then I'm cooking with that, it's not lasting long. I mean, it's, it's not getting a chance to spoil. And that's why I started making some of the sticks a little smaller. And the other day, like I was cooking and I needed some butter in a recipe and I just pulled it out frozen and stuck it in the pan until it melted and it worked just fine. So that's what I'm doing. And hopefully during this season of like the spring grass, whenever we're getting lots of really rich cream, I can make a lot of butter and put it up and you know, when we get to the season of like drying the cows off to rebreed them, we're gonna stagger that so we'll always have one cow in milk 
um, but I'll have extra butter for when I don't have enough cream to make my own. Here are the herbs that I transplanted in my last video. They're looking really good. Super happy, doing very nice. Parsley. So today we actually have a little addition to our farm. I guess I should say lots of little additions to our farm. We got our, I guess annual, you could say annual. We order chicks about every year. Our annual call from the post office saying your chick order is here. You coming, little farm boy? All right, Ben, you ready to go see what we got in the barn? Yeah. All right, hey, alpacas. Oh, y'all wanna come say hi to Raphael, Ooh. little Raffy? He's getting huge. Poor Raph. I'm, I'm, pretend, I'm saying poor Raph because that's what he pretends to be. Raph has to be put in the barn when we are not out here with him. We are um, unloading these chicks and going to a baseball game. So Raph is in the barn. I will inevitably get people upset about that saying, oh, that's so um, irresponsible. Responsible dog training is putting your puppies in a safe place where they cannot develop bad habits when you are not there to train them. So crate training or like this, Raph is in this stall in the barn. It's really important when you have a livestock guardian dog that if they are going to have access to the livestock, that they can be monitored um, so that they don't develop bad habits like chasing animals or pouncing on goats. What are y'all doing? This is a little drama happening between these two. They stopped because that came up. Alpacas make weird noise when they're irritated. All right. So Maya's been out here organizing his tool trailer, which has been his mobile shop for the last year and a half. You want to pick one up? What do you think we should name it? <laughs> oh, are we getting into that now? Yeah. Hi. What a sweet little baby. Is it a girl or a boy? Um, they mostly should be girls. Come here. What are you going to name her? Hannah. Hannah? That's yeah. a pretty name. It's also named after Cab's cousin. Oh, Cab has a cousin named Hannah? Yeah. Cool. You know, my friend, I have a friend named Hannah who I got hope from. Remember that? Okay, well, we have a Hannah namesake. What did you call these when you were little? Baby chips. Baby chips. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Baby chips. Yep, yeah, we've been hanging on to that for a long time. So we ordered our chicks from Murray McMurray Hatchery. The owners of Murray McMurray Hatchery are some of our very, very dear friends. Um, I have made content before we, I went up to the hatchery and did a series of videos there. It's actually the week before everything kind of started with COVID. Um, my flight there and my flight back were like really different atmospheres and I think I was home for about a week and a half before they shut schools down. But um, it was an incredible trip and got to really see the hatchery and how they do things. And um, they, they made an announcement a few weeks ago that one of their barns had had a positive avian flu test. And um, part of the requirements were that they had to cull that barn full of birds. And they used the chicks that were in their incubators to restock their flocks. I think that bird is interrupting me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, that was a really, really hard blow for them. I, the day of, they called me before, um, my friend Ginger called me before the announcement was made, just kind of let me know. But they are still shipping chicks. They just very quickly got that situation under wraps. And thankfully, because they had some breeds that they had been, I mean, preserving and working on for a very long time, but their incubators were completely full because the time of year it was. And so they're going to be able to use the, some of the stock that was in the incubators to replenish their breeding stock. And they have, um, they have it all worked out and they are still shipping chicks. And our chicks are here and they're healthy and beautiful. I can't honestly tell you what all kinds of birds are in these boxes. Um, I don't even really fully remember what I ordered. Can I see that one? 
Oh, that one's beautiful. It's the only white one. It kind of looks... All right. Look here. I can hold it with only two hands. What a pretty bird. I don't know what I think mean. this is not really white. It's more like a silver. It's got kind of like the grayish to its head. Oh, yeah. This one... I'm going to put her back in there because I don't want her to get cold, okay? This one's dark gray. Let's see. Let's show. Oh, look at this dark gray one. That's pretty, huh? Oh, look. Say hello, little baby chip. And then I, and then I saw... So, we ordered... Oh, yes. I think this is a little Americana chick. Look at that. I can't wait to... No, I think that's Americana because it's got the puffy beard and cheeks. Oh, so sweet. So wee, huh? Fun. You like that one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I saw, I found a dark brown one. Oh, that one's pretty. So we're just setting these chicks up in a stall um, in our barn. Here, Jeremiah is innovating this board up with some posts. <laughs> Are you going to put another one up, or is that enough for right now? This is enough for them to start off with, and then I'll move it back as they get bigger and make it a little taller. You don't think there's any concern of, like, rats or anything messing with them? Not with everything that circles around the barn. I mean, we have feed that kind of spills and out of the trough, and we problems. haven't really had any in here, so... Chicks need some sort of bedding in their breeder. We use these pine shavings we get at Tractor Supply in these compressed bales because they work well for the chicks, they absorb a lot of liquid, and they're pretty affordable. The only thing you're not supposed to use is cedar chips uh, because supposedly the aromatic nature of those can be detrimental to chicks. I, we have accidentally used them before and it was okay, but we now use these pine shavings because we've just been told this is what's best for the chicks. So chicks are hatched at Murray McMurray Hatchery in these huge incubators. They're the size of an entire room. And immediately, I mean within hours of hatching, these chicks are put in these boxes and packed and sent all over the country. A chick within a couple of days that it's born is still operating under the nutrition of its yolk. It absorbs that before it comes out of the shell. So it doesn't have to eat or drink. But as soon as you get your chicks out of the box that they come in the mail, you want to dip their beaks in water and give them food to eat because they need it at that point. Chicks. You said it's 66? 67. 67 chicks. They're so loud. I know. Oh. It's actually the next day. We're going to go out and take a look at the chicks, but I just walked past this by my front porch and I got to show you. So this is my first iris bloom of the year. Look at this. Beautiful beautiful flower i'm just so enamored here here about to open up is one of my black irises how amazing is that so i just finished editing the first part of this video and the audio was just kind of weird i'm sorry about that with the loud background noises tried to do some voiceovers i was basically explaining our brooder setup and the part that i did not get because of audio issues was uh, we use these ambient heat plates in our brooding systems because we had an incident a few years ago. Uh, we basically had a heat lamp and I don't remember exactly what happened. It's been a few years ago, but I don't remember if it shorted and started the fire or fell and started the fire, but basically a heat lamp started a fire um, in a brooder in our basement and it killed the chicks. It was quail. There were little quail chicks. It was very sad. Um, thankfully, uh, Jeremiah and Asher were home and smelled it and went down and found it. We're able to put it out before it had spread at all. But since then, we started using exclusively for brooding in buildings like this, um, these heat plates. So that's what we've got set up in here. Eco Glow by Brinzia. And we've used 
heat plates for a while now and I mean it's not like they stay on just a whole lot so they last for a long time and you can get smaller ones too but the what how it works is the chicks are able to go underneath them and warm up and come out if they want to so you don't have that risk of like overheating or underheating and like right now the barn is pretty warm because it's a pretty warm day so you'll see them out a lot more they're they're really probably hiding underneath it there now because i came in here another thing that happens a lot with baby chicks is that they can get what's called pasty butt which is where like their poop piles up on their butt and a lot of times that has to do with temper temperature regulation so uh, we really like these a little bit more of an investment but if you're planning on like raising meat chicks where you're going to need to be brooding seasonally if you're planning on getting new chicks every year or whatever i think it's an investment worth making because those heat lamps you know you end up having to replace the bulbs in those a lot and they really are a fire risk i've heard so many just awful stories about them and i won't i won't ever have one in, in my house again oh look at these babies they're even already so much more coordinated starting to get their real feathers on their wings in just a short period of time it's so funny. I think I shared in my, when I went up to Murray McMurray Hatchery, I think I shared that I used to get catalogs. I used to get like the, the chicken catalog from Murray McMurray Hatchery and the seed catalogs from like Baker Creek and the different places like that. When I lived in town, when I worked at City Hall in the office, selling permits in the permits and planning office, um, and I was so just desperately wanted a farm and I used to get those catalogs and I would just memorize them. And it's so funny now, you know, like when I, we talk about our friends that own Murray McMurray Hatchery and that like getting to be a part of this world is really the only way I know how to put it. It just tickles me. It's, it's such an infinitely more thing that I used to just dream about having some chickens and now we get to get an order of chicks like this and it's it's exciting and it's fun but it's not the first time and it won't be the last time it's not extraordinary i remember when it was still extraordinary and for a while i struggled with the fact that it wasn't anymore that it was more routine even when these chicks came we were rushing to get to a baseball game and just maybe a little stressed out it probably showed in that video that we were like oh gosh we got to get this set up because when you've got something living i mean obviously this takes the precedence the priority i was feeling that oh man why am i and i was feeling that feeling of like you know this the, kind of the stress of a busy afternoon and the fact that this used to be just mind-blowing i used to just cry every time chicks would come because i would just feel so grateful but Sometimes when you're ordinary is extraordinary, it's not that you take it for granted, but it's that you're comfortable in it. And I think that there's a measure of gratitude that uses the blessing you have, that, that lives comfortably in it, that breaks it in and wears it well. And in wearing it well, share it with other people. Because I pour it over chicken catalogs and seed catalogs and blogs at the time. There really wasn't a lot of people doing homesteading on YouTube back then. But now you get to pour over YouTube videos and you get to dream and someday when you're in the fulfillment of it and it's become almost routine, I think maybe there's a measure of gratitude that takes the extraordinary life that's become ordinary and shares it with other people. And it can just go on to plant seeds in them. And maybe they'll cry over their first couple of, of orders of chickens. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe that was just me. <laughs> but but um, I don't know. I'm just sitting here having these poetic musings next to the brooder and just realizing that things change and they mature. And gratitude even changes and matures. It's, all, it's not always dumbfounded. Sometimes it is comfortable and still deeply, deeply thankful. And, and sometimes that means turning around and sharing it. So, deep thoughts over a video about unpacking the chickens. These, these chicks here is our first laying hens that we got a, an order for at our new farm that'll grow up here, that'll lay many, many eggs here. And I'm just, it, it's hitting a little different. This little guy just looked at me like, what are you talking about, lady? <laughs> oh, they're so cute. Well, thank you guys for hanging out with us today. I bless you. Until next time.